everybody, and welcome back to Digital Integrated Circuits. I'm Professor Adam Thiemann of the Enix Labs at bar -Ilan University, and today we'll be going over the Kahoot for Lecture 7, Designing Sequential Logic Circuits. In this Kahoot, we'll have 10 questions. The first is, mark the correct answer, and this is an easy one to start. Sequential logic is a function of the previous state. Combinational logic is a function of the previous state. Sequential logic is a function of the current state. Sequential logic is a function of both current and previous state. And of course, the last answer is the correct one. Going back to our slides, I just want to remind you. What we generally have learned in all kinds of uh, digital systems courses and so forth, or at least at the beginning of them, is about combinational logic circuits. And that's basically a truth table where we have, you know, a list of inputs, um, such as whatever A, B, and C, and then we have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, etc., until 1, 1, 1, and those would be our inputs to our design. Those are these guys. And we will we'll have our list of outputs. Um, so we know that if we put in 0, 0, 0, you know, output 1 and output 2, output 3, maybe we'll get 0, 1, 0, or something like that, and we'll have a list. So this is a general truth table of a combinatorial circuit, which is only a uh, function of the inputs to the design that we see over here. We get some sort of an output. What happens in a sequential circuit is we add these memory elements that store the state of the circuit. So the state of the circuit is what is um, saved here inside the memory element. And then we can add, you know, next to the inputs, the current state of the circuit. So this is the current state of the circuit. And it will also have all of the options that, that can be here. And so in addition to the outputs, then we'll have a whole row of the next state of the circuit. And basically, the next state of the circuit will be taking the current state with the inputs we get over here, the next state of the circuit um, over here, and the outputs are, are just the ones that we take out of the block. So a sequential um, circuit actually uses, uh, you know, a, a clock to... Um, to store usually the state of the circuit, and then um, during every clock edge or something like that, we pass uh, we pass the current state over with the inputs into the combinatorial circuit, and we calculate the next state and the out. Uh, uh, we take the out state and we uh, the next state. Uh, I'm sorry, and um, store it inside the the memory. So that's the current state of our that becomes the current state of our circuit, and we figure out the outputs at that current state. Okay, so that is how a sequential um, circuit works. Question number two. Mark the correct answer, and I guess I'm going easy on you guys today. So, A. Using sequential logic helps eliminate races between signals. B. Using sequential logic can help improve throughput. C. The delay of the registers in sequential log logic decreased throughput. Or D. Answers A and B are correct. So of course that would be answers A and B, and uh, I just used this as a way to kind of reiterate on the two most important concepts about sequential logic, why we use it in general. And the first one is this picture that I really like of what would happen if there were no traffic lights, because the sequential logics or the registers that we use in our circuit, they are basically traffic lights, and they um, are stopping all of the data from running in, you know, uh, colliding with each other. So basically eliminating races is the first, uh, you know, the first reason that we want to synchronize things, that we want to stop it at the traffic lights, wait until everything is ready, and then um, move it over to the next stage. So that's the most important thing. And it's really hard to design things that are, um, that do not use sequential logic, that are not synchronous, and that do not really um, time things up to eliminate races. Uh, that being said, I, for instance, have some research that is trying to remove the, uh, the sequential or the synchronous um, state of the circuit using these types of registers, but it's really hard to do and it's very non-standard. The other reason that we use um, sequential logic is for um, uh, increasing the throughput, and that is through pipelining. And as we saw before, you know, if we have an instruction that takes a long delay to get to the output, you know, this is going to be the latency of, um, of the instruction going through. But what we can do is instead of making our clock fre frequency um, at, at that latency and therefore only launching a new instruction every 
um, time period of this entire latency, we can break down our circuit into several parts and uh, put some sort of a register in between, and therefore we can take our instruction and launch a new instruction every shorter amount of time. Um, it will take you know that amount of time to pass from um, one stage to the next stage, but in the end, once we fill up this type of a pipeline, every single um, cycle, every single new launch of a data path, we'll also get a new um, uh, finish of a previous data path. So that's called pipelining, and in this way we can increase throughput um, through using the synchronous or sequential type of uh, design. Question number three. Mark the incorrect answer. A settable negative edge flip-flop is opaque, locking during the low phase of the clock, only passes data on the falling edge of the clock, is transparent during the low phase of the clock, or outputs a 1 when the set signal is asserted. So the incorrect answer about a settable negative edge flip-flop, and um, it is incorrect that it is transparent during the low phase of the clock. Let us look back at this. And we see here the naming conventions that we use in this course. And actually, these are the naming conventions that are very um, prominently used in the uh, you know, VLSI or microelectronics industry, is that a latch is what we call a level-sensitive level register. So that means it has a certain level, in the case that is shown here, the high level of the enable signal, which is often the clock. Um, during that, the latch is going to be transparent. And there, whatever comes into uh, the D input of the latch, is going to go out at the Q output of the latch. So that is when the latch is uh, higher in its transparent state. And at the other states, it's going to be opaque. Now, notice that in this case, we actually, um, if we have the uh, register at a certain level, when we have the falling edge of the clock over here, when we close the, uh, the latch, we are going to keep that on the output. So it's going to go down here, and that's what we're going to have until the clock uh, rises again. So we're actually sampling the data or, or looking at what is at our input on the falling edge of the clock with a, um, a positive latch or with a, a high-level transparent latch. On the other hand, a flip-flop, and this is what is most commonly used in most sequential circuits that you'll find in industry, it samples on a certain clock edge, usually the rising clock edge as shown here. And in this case, there is a singular point in time, this rising clock edge, at which we take whatever is at the input and we sample it and move it to the output. So again, if we have our flip-flop over here, and we're usually going to put a little um, triangle versus a kind of a a rectangle over here. Um, what is going to happen is that the data can change all over the place over here, but when the rising edge of the clock comes up here, if that was at this singular point, then that is what we're going to hold until the next uh, clock cycle, the next rising edge of the clock cycle, when again, this could have been running around and it was uh, over here again, and uh, it, let's say we sampled over here, so it's, uh, so it's not going to change at all, for example, in this case. So again, in, with a flip-flop, we have a singular point in time, just this point where the um, clock rises for a positive edge triggered uh, flip-flop or falls for a negative uh, edge triggered flip-flop where we sample the input and we lock it into our uh, state of our register. So obviously it is not transparent during the low phase of the clock. Um, is the flip-flop opaque blocking during the low phase of the clock? Yes, it's opaque during both the high and the low phase. It only samples on that one singular point of the rising of the falling edge in this case um, as it's a negative edge flip-flop. It only passes data on the falling edge of the clock. That is exactly the um, definition of a negative edge flip-flop. And it outputs a 1 when the set signal is asserted. So uh, often these flip-flops have a set and or a reset signal. We usually use the word reset to say that we um, put the state into a 0. And we use the set, um, uh, the set terminology to say that we make the uh, state a 1 with uh, some sort of an external input that is not the D of the of the actual flip-flop. Question number four. Mark the incorrect definition. Data must be stable at least T setup before the clock edge. The output of a flip-flop changes TCQ after the data arrives. The data can change with the clock edge if T hold is negative. T setup is different for rising and falling data. So the answer here that is incorrect is this blue one. The output of a flip-flop changes TCQ after the data arrives. 
So let's go back, back again to our slides, and we have the timing definitions um, of a flip-flop. And again, here's our flip-flop as I drew a minute ago. This is a D flip-flop. This is the standard flip-flop that we use all over the place in uh, standard sequential design that you'll find uh, around industry. And we have the clock over here. So we have this rising edge of the clock, which is commonly uh, found, again, using a rising edge um, register and um, we take that point that singular point over here we just took the 50% of the rising edge uh, as an example of the, the, of the singular point and there is some time before that that we have to have the data stable and that is called the setup time and sometime after that that the data at the D input has to be stable and that is called the whole time and we decided in a terminological way that the um, positive uh, access of setup time will be um, in uh, to the left and the negative the positive edge of the whole time will be to the right um, and this actually what it does it defines this window of stability and we require that the data will be stable within some sort of non-negative sized window so um, when we take a positive T setup and a positive T hold it shows this window that the clock edge is in the middle we could have also defined it a bit differently so if we had our uh, clock edge over here and we wanted to define a window that was you know um, uh, all together before the clock that would be okay so here we would have T setup uh, is going to be larger than zero but on the other hand over here because this is going to be the the um, time after the falling the, the rising edge that the data has to be stable and we see that it actually comes before the falling edge so that means that T hold is going to be negative in this case uh, in a corollary um, way if our um, if our window was over here and not um, intersecting with the clock edge then we would have you know a, a positive T hold is going to be uh, larger than zero but a negative T setup T setup is uh, small so we can so all that these um, definitions do is they really say where this window of stability has to be relative to the clock with this uh, terminology that T setup is positive to the left and T hold is positive to the right. TCQ on the other hand is what we would call the propagation delay of the flip flop. So again, the data has to be stable. It has to either you know be one or zero a long time before the clock edge actually reaches T setup time. Again, when I say a long time before, if T setup is negative, then it actually can be after. But um, usually it's going to be before the clock edge arrives, the data has to be stable in, uh, for the flip flop to work correctly. And therefore the only thing that triggers the, uh, but, but it can, but by the way, the, the, the register is opaque, so anything we do here doesn't actually get reflected to the output and change anything that happens on this side of the circuit. Therefore, the only thing that triggers an operation here is the rising edge of the clock, which will then cause you know this to the, the sample the, the value to be sampled and appear on the output. Um, but even though that this is the, the arc that the data actually is going through, the timing arc is from the clock to the output because the clock rising edge is what triggers the operation. So really the clock is going to trigger this. I, I guess you could um, call it from here over to here until the, the output is stable. And that we call the TCQ, the T clock to Q, because this is the clock and this is the Q. So that is the propagation delay of uh, so going back to our definition, we said the output of a flip-flop changes TCQ after the data arrives. The reason that that is incorrect is that the um, output, the, 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 the data arrives at least T set up before the clock arrives, but that can be a, a large number or a small number or something in between. Um, the output doesn't change when the data arrives. It only changes after the clock arrives. So um, that is uh, incorrect. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, data must be stable at least T setup before the clock edge. That is exactly the definition of T setup. The data can change with the clock edge if T hold is negative. So T hold again is how long after the clock edge the data has to be stable. And if the T hold is negative, it means the data can actually change out, um, before the clock edge has arrived and will still sample the correct data that was there, you know, uh, before T setup. Okay, T setup is different for rising and falling data, so that's basically true for almost everything in CMOS technology, that all of these parameters will have a different, um, a different number for rising and falling um, edges. Question number five, what is the problem presented by clock overlap? The data may pass through from the input to the output. 
The flip-flop may be opaque during the rising edge. The clock load is very high, causing power consumption. The feedback may not be strong enough to ride into the flop. So again, we're talking about clock overlap, and the question is, which of these is correct? And the answer is going to be that the data may pass through from the input to the output. Let's see again what clock overlap was. So clock overlap is basically we have a, you know an inverter inside our flip flop usually because we need both a positive uh, clock edge to open such a you know to turn on such a uh, transmission gate and we need uh, maybe a negative uh, one to turn off such a transmission gate something like that. So we we'll usually have an inverter inside. The inverter is actually placed inside the actual standard cell so um, the the to reduce this clock overlap because if we were bringing in two separate you know clock and clock bar type of signals into the flip-flop we would have larger skew between them and this clock overlap would become a very big problem um, as it is it is a tiny bit of a problem and the reason is that um, we you know if I had this you know rising edge of, uh, of clock over here the falling edge will be uh, delayed a bit outside and that will cause you know this situation where we have both clock and clock bar being um, positive for some amount of time and both uh, clock and clock bar being negative for some amount of time and if uh, they are both positive for some amount of time what we're going to have is we're going to have you know this transmission gate and this transmission gate on um, simultaneously and during that time the, if, uh, if it's long enough and these delays are short enough then whatever changed on D will pass through to Q, which is not how a flip-flop works. That's how a transparent latch works. Um, with a flip-flop, we want a singular point where we sample the data. So this is uh, uh, something that cannot happen. Okay, so that is basically the problem of clock overlap. Um, so data may pass through from input to output is the correct answer. On the other hand, the flip-flop may be opaque during um, the rising edge, so that is not our big problem. Uh, the clock load is very high, uh, causing power consumption. That, again, we do not want a high clock load, but it is not a problem caused by clock overlap. Okay, and the feedback may not be strong enough to write into a flop. That's a problem that we showed for ratioed um, flip-flops or latches, but it is not uh, the problem that is caused by clock overlap. Question number six. What is the main benefit of using pulse-triggered latches? Is it creating a clock pulse is easier than a 50% duty cycle clock? The propagation delay is shorter than other flip-flops. A flip-flop can be made with fewer transistors. The clock input can be shared between several flip-flops. So the answer is going to be the yellow one, that a flip-flop can be made with fewer transistors. Okay, so let's go over what a pulse-triggered latch is. So basically, um, with a flip-flop, we had this master-slave configuration where we had to have a negative uh, level or, uh, uh, you know, a transparent zero latch and a transparent one uh, latch that are concatenated one after the other. And they actually give us the effect of a flip-flop where we have a singular single edge that uh, samples the input and passes it to the output. Um, um, but this takes two latches, and latches are rather large um, circuits, and it makes a complex circuit with a lot of um, transistors. What we can do, though, is we can fake it and make a, a type of a, of a, of a flip-flop just out of a single latch. So we basically reduce the area, you could say, by 50% by using a latch. And instead of bringing a clock, which has, you know, usually a clock would have a duty cycle of 50% or something, we can bring a clock that has a very, you know, small glitch a uh, very small pulse that comes into it and therefore just as we saw in the clock overlap problem before the latch would be transparent during this um, this period where our uh, where our pulse is high but as long as we can in ensure through setup and hold time that our data would not change during the time that the clock pulse is high then um, basically we are okay and we're acting basically as a flip-flop we're only sampling what was stable before and we are not passing through what is stable afterwards um, so this is a pulse uh, triggered latch and it's an interesting approach to try and reduce our area and make thing things more simple okay so basically it is passing d to q you know uh, directly during the time that the clock uh, is high however um, due to you know setup and hold constraints it will never have any changes on the data 
while we are transparent, and therefore it is uh, acting as a flip-flop. How do we make such a pulse trigger uh, pulse? So that is a, a quite a problem, actually, how to make the pulse and distribute it, and that li what makes this pulse triggered latching not uh, as popular as it could be. But we can use a clock chopper to uh, make a pulse. So there are ver many variations of this, but basically if we take a clock signal or any other signal, um, input into a logic gate, uh, often an AND gate, but it could be an OR or an AND or an OR or a XOR, and they have different types of functionality and you can play with it and see. And we usually take um, a delayed version of the same signal. Now it could be inverted or not inverted. And in the case of uh, the NAND over here, we take an inverted version of the signal that is delayed. And as you can see, what we get out of that is we get a small uh, positive pulse. But playing around with this, you can get um, a uh, small negative pulse, or we can have a uh, pulse uh, like a, a, a higher duty cycle. So we have a pulse at the end of the clock cycle or something like that. So there are many variations of this. And this is a common circuit that is used to create pulses. So this is something that we can pretty easily do. We don't want to pay for the area to make, you know, uh, to make this thing inside each and every um, flip-flop or else we don't get this benefit of reduced transistors. So we would want to make this pulse and distribute it to uh, many different of these pulse triggered latches. How many? That is a big design question and where we would put them because we need to really control this so we can ensure that the setup and hold times of these latches will ensure their correct functionality. So that's why it's a harder design problem and it is not very commonly used in industry. Um, for the other questions over here, creating a clock pulse is easier than a 50% duty cycle clock. First of all, that is not necessarily true. We're going to have a, uh, a pretty much 50% duty cycle clock in our system, and we're going to create the clock pulse out of it. Um, we do not require a 50% duty cycle clock to have a flip-flop work. In fact, we don't really care what the duty cycle is uh, as long as it keeps a, uh, a constant um, you know, low jitter type of a period. Um, however, usually we do have something that's close to 50%, and if we want to do something like dual edge triggering, we need probably a 50% duty cycle clock, but that's uh, uh, beyond the scope of what I'm talking about today. The propagation delay is shorter than other flip-flops, um, and that is also not necessarily true. Um, the clock input can be shared by several uh, flip-flops, uh, and uh, that is also, uh, that is not, ne that's not necessarily, that's not a benefit of using pulse trigger latches. You can share the clock input uh, for several flip-flops in any case. In fact, they have uh, multi-bit flip-flops, which often do that and maybe share that inverter between several bits or something like that. Question number seven. Which is worse, a max delay or a min delay violation? A max delay, since we will not meet our target frequency. A min delay, since it cannot be fixed after fabrication. Both of them can be fixed by carefully debugging the chip, or neither of them can be fixed, and so they are both horrible. Well, you would think it would be the green one, but it's not actually. It's actually the blue one. I'm in delay since it cannot be fixed after fabrication. So, um, going back to our slides, we see that, uh, that as a summary, we showed that setup constraint, the clock period has to be longer than the path delay. So we have this T over here, which is 1 over F. It's the uh, clock period or, uh, or um, the inverse of the clock frequency. It has to be larger than the delay of the, the entire um, uh, launch path. Um, for the hold constraint, however, we do not have this um, this dependence on the frequency. We need to have the um, the delay of the logic path be larger, you know, than the the hold time that we required. But there is no t in in this second equation over here, and t is an external variable. We can it's something that we can configure. We can change um, uh, from outside. It's an input to our uh, basically to our circuit. It's not something that is um, hard-coded once we, you know, design the chip and, and fabricate it. On the other hand, with hold, since we do not have one of these external type of parameters, we cannot change the frequency and therefore save the chip. If we get a really slow um, uh, chip come out of the fab, we can always use a lower frequency and still meet the setup constraint, but we can never fix a hold constraint and therefore Hold is a, a much worth pro worse problem, and as I say here, you can throw your chip away. We have to be really careful with hold and make sure that we don't have any hold violations, where we can be kind of aggressive and then bin and use faster chips, uh, at a, sell them at a higher frequency and slower chips at a lower frequency. That being said, there are often applications that require a certain frequency, and we have to make sure that every single path uh, meets the setup constraint as well. Our answer is that a min delay is worse since it cannot be fixed after fabrication. Question number eight. 
What is the correct definition of the max delay constraint? Is it t minus t skew minus t jitter is larger than t cq plus t setup plus t logic? t is smaller than t skew plus t jitter plus t cq plus t setup plus t logic. t plus t skew is bigger than t cq plus t setup plus t logic minus the 2t jitter. Or t plus t skew is larger than t cq plus t setup plus 2t jitter plus, two plus t logic. And it's going to be this one. I hope you figured that out. So let's go see why. Basically, um, in all of these timing constraints, we have the launch path, which is this one. This is what is launching the data. So this is the launch path. And we have the capture path. That's this one that's capturing the data. So that's the capture path. If you don't remember um, your uh, equation by heart, and I actually don't usually remember it, I just draw this and I figure it out. So. The clock is going to go over here, you know, and it's going to have the, 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 the time to, uh, you know, T clock one, we could call it. Okay. And then we're going to have the time that the data propagates from the triggering, which is, you know, um, the clock to Q of this. So that would be TCQ. And then we're going to have the combinational logic. It's sometimes called a contamination delay or something like that. So that, that's the logical delay. We call it T logic. And we need to meet in the setup. We need to have that happen. Um, earlier than T setup. Okay. Um, on the other hand, for the for the uh, uh, capture path, we have the clock period. So we're only capturing this on the next clock cycle. So we have a big T over here that starts it. And then this is going to take, um, you know, T clock two, T clock two. And we defined T skew, you know, delta skew is equal to T clock two minus T clock one. Okay. And so um, what we're going to get is that uh, the this delta over here actually help us helps us positive skew helps uh, a max constraint. So T plus delta skew is going to be on the left side of this larger than. So we need the capture path to happen at least T setup time before this. So we have T setup over here plus the delay is going to be um, TCQ plus T logic, and we add in jitter. Now, why is jitter added in as a two times jitter? Because there can be jitter that can actually make T clock one um, come here later, so plus uh, T jitter. And we can have um, T clock two be minus T jitter, having the capture, uh, the capture clock come earlier. And that's because jitter is a random variable. And in one clock cycle, it will happen to one side. And then the other one, it will happen to the other side. So we take the worst case. And it comes out that we add to T jitter to you know, the, the, the slow path over here. So this is going to be the setup or max delay constraint. First, with that, the corollaries, what is the correct definition of the min delay constraint? Is it TCQ minus T hold plus T logic is larger than T minus T skew? TCQ plus T hold plus T logic is going to be larger than T skew. TCQ plus T logic is going to be larger than T skew plus T hold. Or TCQ minus T skew is going to be larger than T logic plus T hold. And look at that for a few seconds. And the answer is going to be this one. Go back to the slides and we'll look at the same type of a thing but now taking hold into account so again we have our um, launch path and our capture path and for our launch path we're again going to have you know t clock one plus tcq plus t logic um, to arrive over here and we have to have that at least t hold before uh, after um, we, uh, we, we, we capture. Here there is no T. Okay, we just have this path, which is going to be T clock two, but we're going to add to that the delta skew. Okay, so in this case, we have for our launch path, it's going to be TCQ plus T logic, that's going to be our launch path over here. And what we want is we want to make sure that we're not going to sample this data that is passed through on the clock on the same clock edge, the clock edge that launched this data. So we're going to say that this has to be slower than or bigger than um, the T hold constraint plus this delta skew. And we can or cannot add this 2T jitter. I actually prefer not to add the 2T jitter because there shouldn't be some sort of worst case jitter between um, 
two clock uh, uh, two clock edges, the same clock edge that arrives at two points in the design. There will be some jitter, but it will be very, very low, since a lot of the jitter, in fact, most of it probably it originates from um, the, the clock source. Okay, so that's going to be um, mutual between the two sides, so you can remove this 2T jitter. So usually I would say it's TCQ T plus T logic has to be larger than T hold plus T skew. And our final question for today, traditionally, what are the conditions tested for max min delay timing constraints? A, the slowest possible corner for max delay check. B, the fastest possible corner for min delay check. C, typical operating corner for both max and min delay checks. Or D, answers A and B are correct. So of course the answer is D, that answers A and B are correct. Let's just remember this. What we have is we have these definitions of corners. So for the corners, we have uh, a fast corner, which uses um, fast, fast devices. So this is going to be the definition of an FF corner, okay, or an FF, FF devices. And for slow, we have um, SS devices. So these are going to be slow, slow devices. We're going to change the parameters of the um, transistors that make up our, our gates. Um, on the other hand, we have to add PVT, you know, process voltage and temperature. So usually for a fast corner, we're going to have a higher voltage. And for a slow corner, we're going to have a lower voltage. And for temperature, not taking into account temperature inversion, for a fast corner, we're going to have a low, volt, uh, low temperature. And for a slow corner, we're going to have a high uh, temperature. For temperature inversion, we're going to turn around these little arrows so it'll be opposite. And therefore, we're going to often check um, a, both uh, temperature, uh, both high and low temperatures for both fast and slow corners. But um, what we want to do is with max delay, usually our problem is that the data propagates through the launch path slow. Um, and so we don't meet the, uh, the, the um, high frequency that we want to meet. And therefore, we will take the slow corner to put ourselves in the worst case and see that even when our data is really, really slow, we still meet the frequency that we set. For, um, for a min delay uh, operation, the problem is that the data may be so fast that it will actually jump from our launch flip-flop to our capture flip-flop too fast. And therefore, we are going to take a worst case where we really get uh, a fast corner. Um, our data is as fast as possible, and we check that we still um, meet our hold conditions. So um, the answer is going to be, of course, that the slowest possible corner is used for max delay check and the fastest possible corner is used for min delay check. That is called a uh, best case, worst case, or a BCWC type of a uh, check. And that was very prominently used until um, maybe 10 years ago or so, maybe a 65 nanometer or so process when we started going over to a uh, multi-mode, multi-corner um, type of simulation, we, we check a lot more stuff than that nowadays. Um, it's not enough usually just to say this max delay and min delay type of a check, but we still do use this for optimization. Um, so that is going to be all for our Kahoot today, and with any questions, you're always welcome to ask me on my channel.